know what happened to them. But the Mormon church teaches that the Negroes are a result of a lack of spiritual valiance in the first estate. That is stupid, okay? That's not true. Uh, they say, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race were cursed with a black skin, the mark of Cain. Peterson said, if a Mormon apostle, if there is one drop of Negro blood in my children, they have received the, they received the curse. Brigham Young said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. There's a good book you ought to get called The Secret History of the Mormon Church to see what's happened, how many people were killed trying to leave the Mormon Church. Uh, I mean, it was a serious thing in the early days. I don't know if it still is. I would hope not, but it certainly was. Read the book about secret history. Third theory about the races says that Noah put a curse on Canaan, his grandson, Canaan. Genesis 9 says, Cursed be Cain, and a servant of servants shall he be. Genesis 9, 26, Canaan shall be a servant. Canaan's a servant. Uh, some people think that uh, Canaan became the first black man, and he, the black people are supposed to be servants. I think that's silly, that's dumb, it's not true. But that, those verses were used to justify slavery during the Civil War here in America. That's not where the races came from. Canaan was not the first black man. The fourth, and I think the most reasonable theory, is that the colors, skin colors came as a result of the Tower of Babel. After the flood, God told them to spread out, have lots of kids, and move around the world. Well, they didn't. They disobeyed God. They stayed in one place, and they tried to build this big tower. Genesis 10, 5 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided, in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. I think what happened at the Tower of Babel, they broke up into languages, and people had to travel off, and you know, those that spoke French went together, and those that spoke German went together, and they ended up, you got to marry into this little group. So you have close inbreeding, and if you marry cousins or you know, sisters or nieces for a few generations, you're going to have a redneck after a while. Very unusual traits will become pronounced. This is what happened to the Habsburg dynasty. They had to marry royalty. Well, pretty soon they started looking really strange. Long nose, you know, weird-looking face, great big chins, uh, six fingers, sometimes hemophiliacs. I mean, a lot of serious problems in the Habsburg dynasty. But Genesis 10, 1032 said, The families of Noah is what created the nations and also the languages. There's a good book by Bill Cooper you can get called After the Flood, which deals with this topic in great detail. One of Noah's sons, uh, Japheth, in Genesis chapter 10, had about 14 kids, their grandkids. It's kind of tough to count. If you go through Genesis, you'll see. It's called the Table of Nations. Very interesting story. But uh, Ham had 31, uh, roughly 31 kids or grandkids, and one of those uh, was Canaan. It's only one of his 31 kids and grandkids. The Bible teaches us that Egypt is the land of Ham. It says so in Psalm 105. Egypt is the land of Ham. And in Psalm 106, it says, the wondrous works in the land of Ham, which is Egypt. There's not a whole lot of question among most Bible scholars that Africa is the land of Ham, the Hamites. So Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Ham settled this direction down in Africa. And the black people predominantly originated from Africa. The Japhethites, the descendants of Japheth, became the Europeans. They traveled over this way. And the Shemites became the Orientals. They traveled, you know, Chinese, Japanese, etc. Shem had about 29 kids or grandkids. Makes up a total of roughly probably 75 original languages. So I think the original, at the, after the Tower of Babel, broke up into maybe 60, 70, 80, or 100 different language groups. I think it's pretty obvious that probably English, German, and Danish had an original root language that was the same. I think probably they have originated from the same language. This is English, for instance, from 1,500 years ago. Now, I can't read but one word on the page. That's just, duh, the first one. So... The English has changed radically in the last 1,500 years, and Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin probably had a common root language. Nobody argues about that. Um, I think a lot of the original languages contained the gospel story. For instance, in Chinese, you see the symbol for boat in the upper right-hand corner here is a combination of the symbol for a vessel, eight, and mouths. Eight mouths in one vessel, that's Noah's Ark. So a boat is the symbol for eight mouths in a vessel. The symbol for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure. The Garden of Eden, two people made from the dust of the ground. There are some great, great books on the Chinese language and how it contains the gospel story. Uh, another book called God's Promise to the Chinese. You can get either one of these through our ministry here. I think God made everybody of one blood according to Acts chapter 17. So you're not superior because of the color of your skin. Malachi said, have we not all one father? 
We all came from Noah, folks, and nobody's superior because of the color of their skin. They've been searching for the Adam and Eve, according to Science Magazine here, you know, Newsweek Magazine. They say we had a common ancestor, one woman who lived 200,000 years ago, mitochondrial Eve. Then later they did research and said, wow, maybe it was only 6,000 years ago because they found that mitochondria you know, changes quicker than they thought. And then they said, oops, we know that can't be right, so we're going to keep searching. <laughs> uh, the fact of the matter is, the, the Bible's right. About 4,400 years ago, we all came from Noah and his descendants. Uh, Noah's three sons, of course, may have been married to sisters or may have been married to somebody other else from before the flood. I'm not sure what the diversity was in the, uh, before the flood back then. Okay, next question. What about cloning? Well, I think cloning is an interesting genetic trick, but it's not, it's not producing anything new. They're taking a DNA code that already exists and transplanting it. And the DNA code is incredibly complex. We cover this on seminar part four, how complex the code is. What happened with the sheep Dolly, they took a four-year-old sheep and they tried to take a cell and take a nucleus out of the cell and put it into a different cell and implant it so it would develop into a new sheep. They had 277 failures. It cost them $50,000 to make that one sheep. And then Dolly ended up aging much faster than normal and died very early. Didn't live near as long as a normal sheep does. So basically, there was a failure. $250,000 for one sheep. I said, fellas, hey, the sheep can do this a whole lot quicker and cheaper. Leave them alone. They're doing fine. Okay. Next question. Why did God make poisonous snakes in a perfect world? I don't know the answer to this one for sure, but I have a theory that might help shed some light on this. Um, Dr. Uh, Guderin, Guderin in western Ecuador has treated 300 cases of snake bite with electric shock. They use a stun gun. If you get bit by a poisonous snake, if they get you within the first, you know, 30 minutes, they will take a stun gun and shock the site of the injury where you got bit. They shock the other side of the limb. And if it's been more than 30 minutes, they go halfway to the heart and shock you again. The electric shock going through your body neutralizes the poison. A lot of people in jungle areas now are carrying little stun guns. And if you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, you spark it and go back to work. So many theories abound on why there were poisonous snakes. Maybe they weren't poisonous. You can contact Carl Ball, Glen Rose, Texas, about the hyperbaric chamber he has there where he raised poisonous snakes, I believe it was copperheads, under hyperbaric conditions, high pressure oxygen, and increased electromagnetic field, which probably the earth had before the flood, stronger magnetic field. After two weeks, his snakes were not poisonous. They were still snakes, of course, but the poison was not harmful to the human body. So uh, 50 milliamp uh, spark at 60 hertz is safe for medical, is a safe medical limit. Many stun guns are 3 milliamp. So it's not a problem at all. They say you should shock the bite as soon as possible. Straddle the bite with the probes and shock twice in an X pattern. If more than 30 minutes has passed, connect a wire to one probe and shock through the limb. This is how they're doing it in uh, missionary schools. They're teaching them how to handle snake bites with uh, stun guns. Or you know, if you can't get that, get a spark plug off of a lawnmower, chainsaw, or a car or something, you know, and shock it. It'll help neutralize the poison.